Wonderful. Thank you so much for your patience. It is October 17th. Um, and we will go ahead and review the rules of this meeting. Um, as a reminder, this is an interpretive meeting, meaning that um, we will ask of attendees to choose the language in which you choose to keep this afternoon's meeting. Um, so in the, there is an icon. Can you still hear me? Can someone give me a thumbs up? Yes. Thank you, Peter. Um, um, please make sure you select the language of your choice by clicking in the interpretation glove icon in your screen. Um, I will also ask you to please speak slowly and pronounce your words and breathe between sentences. Uh, also, to not interrupt the speaker, and if you have your own headset with a microphone, please use it. That avoids hearing echoes, and also um, it helps with clarity. Once you select your channel, um, make sure you're muted or muted whenever you wish to speak. That would limit the background noise. Uh, I'll remind you to please avoid using any idioms for the clarity of these messages. Um, the rules for public participation at city meetings include that we have a set of rules and guidelines to support a productive and meaningful meeting where conversations are inclusive and productive. This vision supports the physical, emotional safety of community members, staff, and um, educational members, as well as the democracy for people of all ages, identities and political perspectives. For more information about the vision and the community engagement process, you can visit the link um, in the screen and you can do so, we have it in English and Spanish. The following are some of the examples of the rules and guidelines that we have for the current found in the, um, in the Boulder Revised Code uh, and other guidelines that support this vision. So one of them is that all remarks and testimony should be limited to remarks uh, or matters related to city business. No participant should make any threats or use any other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity and racial epithets and other speech and behavior that disrupts or impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. And participants are required to sign up to speak using their name and individuals must display the whole name before allowing to speak online. Currently only audio testimony is permitted online. With that, I'll stop sharing and pass the word to our commissioner and chair, J.H. Welcome to the interesting meeting. This meeting is live and recorded. My name is JH and I'm the chair of the commission. Um, I think we have made safer than Alex. And uh, Anna. Well, is Kristen here? No. Kristen no. is sick. Kristen is sick. Okay, so we have. She hasn't had a heart attack. <laughs> we have more than three people, so. And today is uh, October 17. It is 6 17 p.m. We officially start this meeting. Uh, present today, we have me, JH, Anna, Carlos, and Figure. Yeah. So if you already go over to those rules, uh, is that you will go over them again, Christy? No, no. Okay. Sorry. Stop. Uh, we don't need to. We don't need to. Okay. So. 
Um, since Ingrid already went to the rules uh, in the logistic of uh, this recorded meeting, I think we can just move to the second agenda for the adjustment. And uh, thank you. It's starting to approve the last minute to pay in our packets. We had last month minutes. Commissioners, do you have any suggested adjustment? Um, Sorry. If you guys have any adjustment, I think you can feel free while these guys are working in the technology part. If you guys have any adjustment for the last minute, so, uh, from our pocket, whatever you guys have, if you want to add, that's the time to do that. Oops. Sorry. Should be fine. But where does it let you select? Just uh, one part. Strange, it's like showing on the screen. Mm -hmm. I can't find this picture. Sure. I have it. Sorry, more technology. Yeah. <clears throat> Were there any agenda adjustments? No, I don't think so. No. So we can move on and make a motion to approve the October 17, 2023 meeting minutes. Who would like to make a motion? I make the motion to approve the meeting from the October 17 meeting. The minutes, right? Yeah, the minutes. Who will second the motion? Get the motion. Victor, we can hear you. Oh, you can? Can you hear me? Now it's better. Thank you. Okay. I said I second the motion. Uh, all in favor, uh, <clears throat> say hi. Hi. We all raise our hands. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, moving on to um, approving our me uh, previous meeting minutes. At every meeting, our secretary takes notes. Those notes are called minutes. Every month, minutes are included in our packet. We review them and approve them the following month, and that is always part of the agenda. Any adjustment to the minutes? Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I motion to move. Um, I motion to move the approval of the minutes for the meeting of September. Um, I'm sorry, I forget the date. September 19. 19. 19. I second. 
All right. Second second second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Say hi. Hi. Always your hail at home. So uh, that brings us up to item four, which is the community participations. Uh, um, for community participation, members of the public join our meetings and contribute. Today, they can do it online. Each participant has three minutes to share and staff has time to respond. Community members can sign up in advance. Ingrid, has everyone signed up to speak? No, okay. Is anyone present would like to participate? There's only one person in the audience, in the virtual audience. Um, I don't see their hand raised. So you can move on. Okay. Now we can move into agenda six, which is uh, disc discussion of uh, informal items. Now we're at that part of the meetings where we have discussions and informa informational items. As a reminder, we do not need to vote, but I invite commissioners to participate openly. Yeah, we don't um, we don't have any action items in your agenda for tonight. Um, and no adjustments were made to the agenda, so we can move into the discussion and informational items, which were just in time. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Just in time for the slideshow. <laughs> so staff update. Now we are moving on the staff onto the staff update. Hmm? I'll pass these on to Elizabeth and Ingrid. Great. Thank you for taking. Any question on all clarification needed from commissioners? Out to us. Um should I, very much? Huh? Mm -hmm. Should I do this one? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so hi, everybody. This is Elizabeth Crow with uh, Housing and Human Services, uh, Deputy Director, and i um, very glad to share a little bit of information with the HRC tonight about the Elevate Boulder program. It's our direct cash assistance program for financial stability. We have been um, planning this uh, project for a couple of years and we're almost ready to launch the application process. Um, we've shared information previously with uh, HRC members about this, but I'll just a uh, quick reminder. Um, guaranteed income or direct cash assistance are terms that describe when we will give um, unrestricted, unconditional financial support to um, selected low-income community members, and it's to help people be able to decrease their debt, to increase their savings if they want, um, to help take care of the basic needs of their family. What makes it different from other benefits programs like food assistance or rental assistance is that uh, once people receive these funds, um, they choose what they want to do with them. There are no restrictions on how, um, how they spend that. Um, we are one of about 30 or 40 cities in the country that either already have done a pilot project like this or are ha currently have a pilot project um, happening or taking place. And the results are very good that when you give people cash assistance or guaranteed income for a period of time and let them make decisions on how they want to use that to take care of themselves or their family, um, they do better. And I think that's not surprising to any one of you. <laughs> this is how um, this is how life works for many people. They, they are not lacking in character. They're lacking in enough cash to be able to afford to live well. So with this project, um, we are hoping that um, community members who will be selected to receive the funds are able to really improve their financial stability, improve their food security, they'll be able to afford to 
buy what they need to, to eat better, um, to get the health care they need, to experience less stress and anxiety that can come with um, experiencing low income. And we hope many, many other good outcomes, positive outcomes for people. Um, so we're going to be launching the application um, process um, late this month and community members will have um, several weeks to fill out applications. Um, they have to be eligible and there are four um, levels of eligibility. One is they have to live in the city of Boulder. The second is that they have to be 18 years old or older. The third is that um, they have to be between 30 and 60% of the area median income for the city of Boulder. And for one person, I should have the information right in front of me here, but I don't. Um, for one person that can be, I think it's less than $27,000 and you know up to a certain amount, but it's in that a specific income range. And then fourth, um, they have to have experienced COVID hardship. And that can be anything from having um, gotten sick or have to take care of somebody in their family or your household who was um, had COVID or, or was ill. Um, you may have had reduced work hours or lost job, um, have had a challenge receiving or getting childcare or pretty much any other problem that any of us experienced for COVID. The reason that we're asking that question in this application is because the funds that we're using for this project are part of the city's COVID-19 relief funds from the federal government. And we have to report out on how we spend all of that. So we're gonna ask just to make sure we're in the good. <laughs> um, so we're really excited about this project. And um, if any HRC members would like, um, we can share some, um, information with you when it's available next week as we're going to be kind of announcing more publicly when the application period will launch. And I'm happy to share some other informational materials with you if you wanted to circulate that, um, share that through the community. Um, also on this slide is just a, a link when you receive the PowerPoint for a documentary um, about a documentary event that we held um, last week. <laughs> Time flies. It's already been a week since we did that. Um, it was a, is a documentary that focuses on the guaranteed income programs and how they have benefited people who have, um, been participants in other cities. Um, uh, one of our Boulder community members, Magali, um, Mateo was a panelist afterward, along with two other um, participants from other parts of the country. And we had a wonderful dance performance um, from a local breakdance group, which was really great. It had people on their feet and clapping. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was a really lovely event. Um, we recorded it and hopefully we'll be able to share it after the program launches when we have time to do so uh, with other community, community members who were not able to go that evening. And then the link here, on the slide is for the uh, web page for the pilot project. We will continue to update that web page when more information is available. Um, right now, the application process has not yet begun as of October 17, and um, our staff do not have the capacity to kind of answer phone calls or emails about it yet. But once the application process opens, we will have a uh, full-time staff member throughout the application process who is English and Spanish bilingual. We'll have five, actually six organizations, nonprofit organizations, helping um, people who need it, uh, who want to apply and need some assistance, and um, providing lots more information um, online so people can find out whether they're eligible to apply, and then um, how the selection process and payment process will continue. Um, so again, we're very excited about this. There's a lot to do um, the rest of this month. So our team is very busy and um, happy to answer any questions you have.
I may have a few questions, if that's okay. Please. Oh, can you explain to me a little better the part where you said 30 and 60 percent? Area median income. Sure. Yeah. So um, it is a little bit tricky. It's just a word that um, it it's a different number depending on where you live in the country um, because the average income is different yeah, where yeah. you live. So, um, so this is um, 30 to 60% area median income means whatever the average income is for Boulder, it's people who are kind of 30 or 60% of that of that amount. So what I can do is when we've kind of, um, after I maybe share on the next slide and Ingrid is presenting, I can bring up the chart on the website and, and show you, it's, it's easier to explain that way. But it also, the number, the income number or range also depends on how many people are in your household. So if you're kind of one person in your household, right, um, is one number. If you have two or three or four or five, up to eight, you know, people in your household, it's a different number. So everyone who's interested in applying will have to look at that chart and determine where your household income is and then determine whether or not you're eligible. And we have some information that help people understand what that is. I don't know that I'm explaining it very well. <laughs> so I, if I may interject here, it's also a guideline that is used for benefits. Yes. So usually it depends on your income and the number of family members that you may be eligible for other benefits that are available in the community. So let's say for low-income housing, they may refer to some of their programs by saying you have to be between zero and 30% to be able to be eligible for this. Uh, subsidized housing program um, or the other programs that have a different um, requirement but is based on this table. So it will be great when Elizabeth shares um, the screen, I, I mean the table because it's a lot easier as she said to understand it. What's the other question that you have? Uh, the other question is, you, I, uh, Elizabeth just said uh, the money is from COVID, correct? Mm -hmm. How do you guys decide to allocate it in something like that? Like, what I'm trying to say is, um, hope it makes sense. Like, let's say uh, in the last meeting, uh, I think, uh, what's his name? Lindsay and uh, Beagle? Art? No, not Stan. Art. Stan, sorry. Mm -hmm. Stan was in the meeting. I feel like, yes, you guys are still, I'm not saying the fund is misused. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to explain is why do you choose a specific program? While, for example, that's, I just made the calculation. It's going to be around you know, like 2.5 million close. Why, like since we are fighting a homeless situation here, why didn't we use that fund for that? Why did it go there? Who made that decision? Sure. So, um, well, one of the things we could do if uh, commissioners are interested is share some information about where all of the ARPA funds are going. Um, so we actually did have um, several million dollars that are allocated from ARPA funds or American Rescue Plan Act specifically for homeless uh, programs that serve homeless community members. Um, I'm happy to, to share information about those. Um, a lot more funds that are going out for financial assistance, rental assistance, um, a second mortgage program um, for community members living in um, Ponderosa that will help low-income people own homes um, who are currently in manufactured housing. Um, a lot of other programs. Um, behavioral health is another category. Child care is another category. Um, and then besides for all of that, other um, funds that are going for uh, utility assistance, um, business support, et cetera. So I'd be happy to share kind of uh, with you the uh, dashboard online that shows where all of the ARPA funds go. What we want, what made us excited about this project is that um, it can be a good use of one-time funds, which is what ARPA is. You can only use them once. Um, 
and it enables a, um, us to have a project like this that focuses on our low income community members as a pilot. Um, it can be very transformative. It's one of the kind of criteria that we have as a city that we want these funds to be able not only to be used for kind of basic needs, things that we need all the time, but things that could make a big kind of system-wide change um, in our community. And this is one of those ways um, that cities all over the country are finding is really a unique opportunity um, to help community members on top of what we already provide. So in short, I mean, we had a, I could go into detail about like how we decided to use all of the ARPA funds, um, mm -hmm. but if you wanted just to know about like <laughs> why this project, um, it's just really been transformative in other communities and we wanted to be able to try it here. All right. The reason I'm asking you is, is like, okay, let's put it that way. I feel like, we have a, uh, if we put it as a, like, number one to 10, let's put it that way, okay? Someone who lives in Boulder that lives in low-income housing already at four. And if you look at it homeless, it's at zero. So why don't we bring, bring the zero to three instead of keep going up? Because I'm not saying it's wrong to help people. That's not what I'm saying. I feel like, why do we neglect the most vulnerable people, for example, and keep, you know, I'm wondering if like, I'm trying to explain, I don't know what's the right word to use. Is it like, it was that decision from you guys staff or is it a study you did? Or is it something you look to other cities? Or is it like something you guys look in the city of Boulder to feel like, okay, that will do more impact because you know, on the community, it's going to get cold. Let's put it that way. Those homeless, we may end up having 10 or 20 of them died. And if we could use part of that fund, or like since it's already there, it's a project you guys work on hard. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong, but could we have done it different? That's what I'm saying. Like, what could have done, could someone have done better to make that fund use? Like, it's a one time, like you said, you know, this winter probably going to be hard. Instead of having people sleeping on the street, we could have house rented. And it's a one time, that's going to be a one time use, no matter how you see it. You see it all. Instead of having a certain fund for emergency, I think that could have been good. But my, again, let me go back to my basic question to say, how did you guys determine that would be more valuable to the community instead of versus like this, I would say, you know, this homeless issue that's hurting everyone here. Mm -hmm. now, you know, I'm part of it because I'm telling you like where my business is at, we have a huge clip behind it. You know, we call the sheriff all the time, but in the end of the day, they keep coming back. Uh -huh. So so I think what I would say is that we um we have a lot of funding, including ARPA funds, but um, millions every year that we mm -hmm. are allocating for um, housing services, for um, assistance to community members who are um, homeless, for shelter, for basic needs. One of the ARPA projects we're supporting is um, support for people who have recently transitioned from homelessness to housing to, so they can stay in their housing and not experiencing challenges that might result them losing their homes. Um, so we have millions and millions every year that we are spending um, to help um, community members who are homeless. Um, I don't think it's either this or that. I think we decided to do this because it's also needed. Um, but again, happy to share, um, you know, at a future meeting or we can send some information sure, sure. out about kind of where all the funds that are going, um, if it's helpful um, for homeless services, ARPA, and then just in any given year um, for the city um, well, toward homeless services. Would that be helpful? The last part you said, you said again, this? The last part? Um, I'm not sure what I just said. I, I'd be happy to share um, if, if it would be helpful to see kind of where city funds are going currently um, to support homeless community members. Yeah, that would be good if I can see that. Sure. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Cool. I want to see too because I, I want to know what kind of help exists for homeless people. 
I have another question about that, uh, Elizabeth, if I'm not taking too much time. Yes, I hope that's not. Um, in this, you say the someone has to be 18, okay? Mm -hmm. Leave in the city, all right? Correct. Uh, and where was it? I wrote it down. Leave in the city. So let's put it. Um, um, do you guys have a target of how many people? If it's why do you like choose two hundred? Is it just like do you guys have a target? Because since like if you look at the city, really like uh, the city limit, I feel like to be clear, sixty percent of the people who live here have enough. How do you guys determine two hundred? Like, is it like a studio date or is it just a random number? No, it's not random. Um, so, and actually, I should say the the photo on the slide. Um, besides for people like Ingrid and me and a couple of other staff members, <laughs> um, is our nine person community task force that uh, were our community members. Um, who applied for and then um, were chosen to be on an advisory committee. So we work together with them to help kind of make decisions on kind of the basic elements of this project, including how much money, um, how often they people would receive it, how long. And we did um, all of the things that you um, suggested. We spent a lot of time looking at what other cities have done and um, what kind of difference it made for people who would receive funds for one year as opposed to 18 months or two years. Yeah. And also how much money makes a difference. Um, for some communities, they're giving less money but a longer period of time. Um, some cities are giving more money per month for a shorter period of time. So there's all different kinds of you know, scenarios. And um, what we came down to with our uh, city staff and our task force members was also looking at how much money we have in total in your rights, three million for the project, 2.4 million will go directly to community members. To try to also have a number that was large enough so that when we're done with the pilot, um, we have some good data, right? So if you're a researcher and we had a pilot project that only had 10 people in it, we'd say like, well, that doesn't really tell us anything. <laughs> but when it's a larger number, you can see more about kind of trends in how people did, you know, what if somebody did really well or experienced, you know, a lot of benefit from participating in this project. Um, if it was one person that tells you, well, that's good. But if it's a lot more people or we see differences in how people experienced um, participating in this program, like where and how it benefited them, it's a large enough number that will so like, well, that tells us something about how this might affect um, our community if we were to continue doing it beyond the pit. So when you kind of take how many people you really need to have a, a good number for a, a pilot project like this, so we can you know learn the most from it and the kind of dollar amount per month that shows that makes a kind of has the most benefit and the length of time um, some evidence shows that the longer the period of time, the better you do. Because if you know you're getting a certain amount of money for one year, that's great. But if you know it's two years, that enables you to plan and to try different things out that you know you're having this money. Um, so that's kind of in short how we landed on that number. It was through a lot of research um, and experiences from other cities that have already done the pilots and then getting the input from our um, task force members um, who are older community members who all identified as um, low income and experiencing and or experiencing disabilities. It's a great question, thank you. I have a question, a couple of questions. Uh, who is going to do this selection of the people and how is going to be the selection? Sure. Because uh, I start in, a, in another meeting, I start um, hearing that uh, sometimes 
is a people selected that doesn't need this? It's a good question. So what will happen is when um, people apply after the application process is done, deadline is passed, then um, we have a, a, one of the consultant groups that's working with us called Omni Institute. Um, they will run a random lottery process. So it's like a lot of other processes in the city. If you, you know, applied to receive a voucher for an electronic bike or, you know, anything like that, you apply and then you're randomly selected. So they will select people who, um, um, who have applied, who are, who were eligible. And um, we won't necessarily know who they are, like city staff or non nobody looks at a list and says, we want you, we want you, we want you. They're just randomly selected. Um, and then if there's someone who is selected and it turns out they're not eligible or they weren't able, they weren't able to provide, you know, kind of um, proof or verification that they live in the city or 18, you know, that this is their income, et cetera. Um, then they will be, they could be replaced with somebody else um, who was also selected. So that's how we get to that point. There are other programs where organizations will screen, you know, people for eligibility and recommend them for programs. This isn't that, it's totally random um, selection based on who applies. Okay. Can I add one more question? Uh, Let me put it uh, that way. And, and like I say, nothing against the thing it's like I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. um, let's say somebody lives in low-income house, as an example. They already receive um food site. Food site. Like an example. I feel like these people are eligible or not. Or should we choose people who who have not like to live in low-income housing but doesn't get the second benefits? Mm -hmm for food or people who just get that benefits but then like get the housing like is there a way to select that or it doesn't matter um it doesn't matter for the sake of the the application or the selection so when people apply where part of the application will ask us are you receiving any benefits um but that's really just so we can understand um because what we know so that we can understand through this process um, how many people, because we know it's already is a lot, who are housed, um, who already receive some kind of um, support like food benefits or mm -hmm. healthcare and are still really struggling. So one of the conversations that, um, and kind of information we have about our community is that it takes about, um, for a, a parent and two children, um, around $99,000 in income to be able to afford to meet their basic needs. And so that is through the Colorado Center for Law and Policy, their self-sufficiency um, standard is for Boulder County is 99,000 for a parent and two children to be able to, to afford your basic needs. Um, and we know that there are a lot of people who are living way under that amount. And this kind of income range includes people who are considered to be very low income mm -hmm. and people who are considered to be low income. They're working or have some form of income, but it is not enough. And they're at risk of losing, um, they're at risk of um, uh, um, experiencing housing insecurity, food insecurity, and all those things. So these are things we, we do know, we know about our community, right? Um, sure. And so it doesn't matter for um, the application if people are receiving those benefits or not. Part of why this kind of project is really exciting is because it acknowledges that those, those benefits are often not enough. They're helpful. We hope people get them. This isn't replacing that. It's showing like this is what it really takes um, to enable someone to, to have their basic needs met in Boulder. Is there a next question? Uh, the, is the application going to be easy to fill or people is going to need help to do it? Both. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
So we're, and, and Ingrid can chime in here too if you want, because she's Perfect. been part of our city team working on this. We um, have worked to design the application so that it is very simple. And we've had a lot of um, uh, members of the task force um, have been testing the application and giving comments about like, here's what worked well, here this part wasn't clear, can you make this easier? Can you make this better, easier to understand? Can you change? Can you change this? And the consultants have done that. And so we believe that we have an application that it will be very easy for someone to fill out themselves. Um, it does need to be online, um, but if you have that uh, internet connection or know somebody who does, can be a phone or a tablet like you have, um, they should be able to do it. And we have people available to help. There will be an email address, a phone number that people can use any time of day to send a note or leave a message and somebody will call them back and help them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and we'll also have some places and times where people can go in person, say if somebody really wants to apply but they don't have a computer or you know need some help kind of attaching documents, they're not sure about that part. Um, they will be able to get help in person as well. It's also going to be, everything is going to be in English and Spanish and Nepalese, which are kind of our three main languages in Boulder, so that should help too. I think the best way to stay tuned and again, be informed, you can reach out to us at any time, of course, but um, in the webpage, you can see, which I have linked to your spreadsheet um, and added there, you can uh, see the up, those upcoming events that are going to happen at different locations for people to, and different schedules too, for people to stop by and receive help. But those are not the only channels. And, and I skim this because I have people that when, when, when this uh, project happens, that they need to apply, mm -hmm. comes to me and as me, help me to fill the application or, because I don't have a computer or yeah. anything. Yeah, we'll be able to help with that. And we are working with five um, organizations who are also going to have staff members available to help. Um, uh, Family Learning Center, I Have a Dream, El Centro Amistad, Out Boulder County, and my CPWD. Thank you, Center for People with Disabilities. Um, and a lot of these organ a lot of people in the community, they already know those groups. And so if they don't want to kind of come to the city government for help, they can do that. Um, there are Boulder, Boulder Housing Partner staff who will be trained um, to be able to help people. Um, so we should have um, a lot of people available to provide that help. And you're more than welcome to as well, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that it's been remarkable to work with this task force. Um, conversations have been channel challenging in a good way, uh, where um, we could all aspire to do what's impossible and fix um, and, and grant <laughs> money to whoever is in need. Um, and yet it's, it's a pilot program, right? So. Um, I'm really looking forward. This is a an, very exciting project for me uh, personally, for many reasons, um, but especially I, I'm really looking forward to hear what impacts it has in our community um, and hear the stories of people who will be participating in this project. Yeah. Good. We do have uh, Brenda Rittenauer in the room and she will be, um, she's next in line. Uh, we're a couple of minutes behind the agenda. So I just wanna be aware of time and if it's okay with you all, we can invite her to um, cover our next discussion items that we have in the agenda. May I ask Elizabeth, one last question. Yeah, go for it. Part. If somebody is either, like, is not a paper, is, is yeah. the person going to be able to okay. yeah. right. And reach out to me anytime. Send right. me an email yeah. if you have any other questions. Okay. Yeah, like if somebody doesn't have a green card or... Well. Doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Okay. I just want to make sure. Thank you. 
Hi, Ingrid, I can't start my video. It says host has stopped it. So I think okay. maybe you just need to um, find me on the participant list and give me permission. I will. Um, oh, sure. Let me make you a call host, okay? Perfect, because I'll need to share too. So that'll work out perfect. Yeah, for some reason, he's still sharing my screen, but it's not allowing me to. Oh, it doesn't let people add maybe. Well, hello. Hi, I um, am happy to join you. I'm sorry I'm not joining you in person. Tuesdays can be complicated for me, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to get to join from my upstairs office at my house. Um, and I am Brenda Rittenauer from our communication and engagement team. I know that I have joined you in this room before, I believe last month, just to help Ingrid, but also in other ways. And I am talking way too fast. So I'm sorry, Mayra and Elena. I will be better behaved. Um, I have come tonight to share with you. I, I should ask Ingrid if she wanted to frame this in any way first. I just launched in. No, you can go ahead. I think we, um, in past meetings, um, you all express interest in learning more about the Emergency Response Connectors Program, the Connectors and Residence Program, and there's other programs in the city that inform um, what we know what, and also what kind of uh, initiatives are out there that go beyond um, these two specific groups in connecting and getting input from the community. Um, there's no one else that does that work better than our communications and engagement team. So Brenda is here tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, please go ahead and take the floor. Great, can you see my screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and my other monitor is over here, which helps it be large enough for me to actually see what's on the screen. So if I'm looking that way, that's why. Um, so yes, I am happy to come tonight to join you to share about communication and engagement in general at the city of Boulder, and then to dive a little deeper into the connector program. So um, on this on my screen, you'll see um, the presentation that was given earlier this year. So your newest member of the commission may have seen this information already as part of orientation. Others who've joined in the last couple of years may have seen it in the past. Um, so I will go through it fairly quickly, but wanted to make sure that I was hitting all of the important information that we really feel is relevant to boards and commissions. And I'll also be sure to talk slower and to hold for questions every so often. Please feel free to interrupt me. Um, you're very small on my screen, those of you who are in the room, so I won't necessarily see you trying to get my attention. So please interrupt out loud if you wish. Um, so there's a lot of words on these slides. So I'm not going to read them all and you don't need to worry about many of them, um, but it helps guide sort of where I'm going with my story for you today. So the communication and engagement department is a centralized department at the city of Boulder, which was not always true. And I'll show you that timeline in a moment. Um, and we feel it's most important to um, talk with boards and commissions about engagement, because that's often what you're most curious about and where we intersect with your work most often. I will say that um, Housing and Human Services has a communication professional that is embedded in their department. Her name is Lindsay Morse Castillas. I'm not saying her last name right. Um, and she's amazing. And she is um, works alongside the staff in Housing and Human Services and is employed in the Communication and Engagement Department. So she plays sort of has um, two homes at the city. So she's fully supported by all of the professionals on our team in the department. And then she works to really help get information out and um, navigate various communication channels for Housing and Human Services specifically. 
Um, so that's how communication often works across the city. Um, engagement, we're a little bit different. Um, we are here, I'll continue on a little. Um, we are a mostly centralized team. Um, so there's now nine of us in different roles. We've grown from three to nine people. Um, two of those people are embedded in specific departments, one in our planning department and one in climate initiatives. Um, that's true because those two departments have identified a great need for regular strategic engagement planning. And so they have invested in professionals to help them do that work on an ongoing basis. Most departments do engagement project by project. Um, so something comes up where we really want the community's voice as part of the decision and resources and a team from the department, sometimes from my team, come around that to make that happen. <clears throat> that makes me realize I should back up a moment to this slide where it says engagement, which is an active relationship between the city and the community that includes and encourages levels of two-way dialogue in decision-making processes. So a lot of times we talk about how communication goes one way from the city. It's we have something to tell you, we're going to tell you in lots of different ways so that you have that information. Engagement is where we jump into a dialogue with community members in many different ways around perhaps a specific topic, a specific decision of a specific topic that city council is making or that city staff are making. And we want to know what the community believes will be the positive or negative impacts of those decisions so that we can be fully informed as we make them. Um, that is something that our team is deeply committed to. Um, we find it incredibly important to lift the voices of our community and strengthen the democracy that exists in our government in all ways. Um, and in Boulder, we take very seriously the fact that um, Many of our community members have been historically excluded from that conversation. And so some of the methods I'll talk with you about today are extremely intentional to build trust in communities where trusting the government is not easy, um, is lifting voices and listening to voices and making change based on those voices. Um, that have not been included in the conversation in the past. Um, that is how we center our work in our department. It's how we have centered our work from the beginning. Um, so I'm excited to get to share what some of that looks like with you today. Um, that's sort of what this slide says. It's not really important. <laughs> um, this sort of is how our engagement team developed. Um, there was a community group um, because we love a task force at the city of Boulder. It's one of the things that makes us strong. Um, and that community group was called the Part Public Participation Working Group. Um, and they came together for 18 months and they met 30 times and they really wrestled with where the public was able to be involved in decisions in Boulder. There was a sense at the beginning of that, that it wasn't going well, that people were not included, that voices were not heard, that city staff was making decisions and only pretending to hear the community about them. And they weren't wrong. We had a, yep, yeah, sorry. Was that just feedback? Okay, sorry, I thought someone was jumping in. Um, we had a bad habit of sort of going out into the community and saying, hey, community, here's a thing, what do you think? But not providing enough information about that thing and not saying, here's what we already know and here's the question that we're asking you and here's how we're going to use that information. That was not happening. And so as a result, people were feeling unheard because they would say, 
here's how I feel about that thing that you asked me about. And here's all the ideas I have about that thing you asked me about because they hadn't been given the information that we already knew what was feasible and what wasn't. And we really only had certain areas that were opportunities to impact that decision. So that's what we work toward now, um, doing that better. So this group met, they identified a lot of those problems for us. And then um, in summer of 2017, exactly a month after I started working at the city of Boulder, uh, they presented their report. And I was not hired as part of the engagement team, fun fact, when I started. Um, but this report was released. Um, and in fall of 2017, a strategic framework had been created. And it was very clear that my role dovetailed directly into that framework. And I should be a part of that team. My original role was neighborhood liaison where it was my job to really connect with people who lived in Boulder and listen to them and make sure that other people at the city listened to them and helped address what they needed. So that job was engagement. And so here I am in the department. Um, we had three of us at the beginning trying to shift a culture. Um, we did that in a few ways that you'll see coming up next. And then in 2020, our engagement manager was asked to be the director of communication. And she said, I will do that if I can take engagement with me. So let me talk to my team and see if they want to come with me. <laughs> so she talked to us and we said, yes, of course, communication is part of engagement and engagement is part of communication. We should be together. So here we are in a much larger and better resource department. Um, so that is the last slide. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the change of culture that we are working on. Um, transparency is a big part of that culture change. And as I'm sure you all are well aware, often the hardest part of that culture change. Um, it is hard to make sure everyone is aware of every step along the way in a decision. Um, and so that's something that we work at and know that there is room for improvement at. Um, but that's one of our real goals. We want to help our colleagues across the system um, be open in those conversations, um, make sure that they are identifying well what decisions we should be talking with the community about, what decisions maybe we can make as a staff because they're more technical and there's less opportunity to actually impact the decision because of technical issues. Um, and in that way, we can best and strategically use our resources across the sometimes hundreds of decisions that are made throughout a year. Um, we really try to focus on impact of decisions, on who is being impact, and how we listen to those people who are being impact, as well as um, others who might be secondary impact or third impact or fourth impact. Um, so, and then, so there were a lot of, of recommendations that they made, that culture piece where we're more strategic about it, um, that we needed to show up differently with the community and that we also need to resource the community to show up differently um, so that we can all stay part of the conversation. Public discourse can get heated and hard and um, emotional and we welcome all of that and we want to not be verbally abusing each other in a room right? So before your meetings, Ingrid shows some slides that talk about our guidelines for the meeting. And that's part of the work that where those came from is inviting everyone to be in community together so that we can be productive together, so that we can welcome the emotion, so that we can hear lived experience and use that information instead of just feeling beaten up by it. 
right? Um, and that goes both ways and three ways, right? Sometimes it's commission members, staff members, and community members. And everyone is responsible in that triangle for building that productive atmosphere. That's a lot of the work that I do directly um, with my colleagues and with the community. And then um, being clear and transparent, which I talked about was a recommendation and then resourcing the work. So that's why we have a staff and that's why as the need for engagement and the ways we engage and the appetite for engagement grows throughout the city, our staff has also been able to grow because resourcing the work has identified as an important part of what we do. These are, These our, are our three sort of primary words and now we've added equity, which you don't see on this bubble, but um, meaningful, inclusive, equitable, transparent. Those are the words that we live by in the engagement team and encourage across the organization. We do a lot of different things. There's a strategic framework. I know that we are short on time um, and want to be sure I get to everything. So I encourage you to read this document. I will um, send it to Ingrid if I don't have time to put it in the chat before the end of this meeting. But um, that is our guiding document that was developed in 2017. We've learned a lot in the years since 2017. Much of it still holds true. And we're working on our next version of this document right now to include some of the things we've learned, particularly through COVID, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, these are our strategies for success. These are sort of the way we initially started to learn to think about our work that now we feel is hopefully embedded in what we do. So I'm just going to read them out loud. And if any of them are confusing, please stop me and we'll dive into them. Uh, learn together, which means, um, as I said, don't just ask the community about a thing. Let's talk about what the thing is. Let's learn together the different aspects of the thing and then have dialogue. Excuse me. Help people know what to expect. So help people follow all of those steps of a decision and understand where their moment for impacting that decision is and then how they see the results of the dialogue that they offered. Cultivate respectful and inclusive relationships. Um, this is my favorite part of what we do because I get to connect with all of the really, really cool people that live in Boulder. Um, and as I've said, often the people who have not been included in these types of processes in the past. Um, be transparent, I've already talked quite a bit about. Use the right tools is that strategic piece I mentioned where we're not doing full community engagement on every single question, especially if it only involves one neighborhood, but we're weighing who's impacted, what voices do we need, what information will, will really make a difference on this decision and how do we get that? Um, and then evaluate and evolve. Um, how are we doing? What are we doing? Should we be doing it differently? What tools do we need today as opposed to in 2017? All right, what else do we do? We do a lot of internal work. The room's getting tired, okay. Um, sorry, note from Elizabeth, I'm talking too much. Let me check in with you all. Um, ask what you are thinking about um, what I'm saying and what would be of most interest to you with our time together today. I will get to connectors next. Maybe that's the hot topic of the day. JH, what do you think? Uh... Sure. Okay. Cool. I'll go. Um, you know, that's a that's beautiful the work. And uh, one thing I uh, would say is um, I feel like that's good work, but I think it's centered on 
probably a limited amount of people. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. once they have power, it changes. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna give you um and I'm speaking with my heart here, okay? Yeah. I'm yeah. gonna give you my full um uh understanding about it. Uh the part I just was taking some note while you were talking, you say that it's a two-way dialogue in Boulder and uh for the community. And I don't think uh, mm. uh the outside sees it that way because mm. My experience here with a lot is if it doesn't work, there will be a loopholes or uh, a way to um, make it not work. And uh, one other thing I'm going to point out to, to you is uh, it's one thing that I read this week. Uh, it's an article wrote by somebody about the Boulder Police Oversight. That's the mm -hmm. best I'll update for you. If you look at it, um, I think one of the best lines I've seen there is, is that, uh, I'm trying to find it because I just printed it out and the phone turned off. It's uh, it's about the Boulder uh, uh, city is pretty much taking power away from the people. Mm. And that's what's one of the best lines. And I do understand your work is amazing. And so mm -hmm. what I'm saying, I'm not printing out to you. Your work is, is good, but I think, uh, how do we make that a reality? I feel like it's a yeah. ritual you're doing right now. So how do, how do, how do you make that real? Because yeah. if, if you, I think uh, this article was uh, on the, I don't know if I'm if, if, uh, allowed to say, it. it was an article in the Boulder Reporting Lab, mm -hmm. and it was well written about mm -hmm. Uh, yes, you talk about inclusive, inclusive and being transparent. One mm -hmm. thing that it's a lot as a minority member of the community and being here is that right now you can be a super racist and be part of the Boulder Police Oversight. Mm -hmm. And as a, me, as someone who is a minority here, I've been here only for 16 years max. I'm going to give you a quick example. The Boulder police, on mm -hmm. three occasions, harassed me, but I couldn't find justice. Imagine you have somebody, a racist, and the Boulder oversight, uh, the police oversight power. So like I said, you know, the talk is beautiful. Mm -hmm. How do we make that real? Yeah. That's because totally. in 15 years, officer, you know, uh, he died in the King Supers thing, put his mm -hmm. gun on that for no reason. Anything I did never happened. The second one was one, I think his name was Smiley, that, um, how do you say, claimed that I stole my car. Mm. I tried everything. Inside of them, they have a way, they manipulate the evidence, they take time, they make it a thing that should take two weeks, they go, Eight months. In February, same thing. A cop showed up at my business, almost arrested me, say that I put out of bank where there are plenty of cameras, evidences, claimed that I stole, not stole, I deposited a $70,000 70, fraudulent check. I don't think Boulder has the people power. I think they're taking power away from mm -hmm. the community. And I think mm -hmm. the work you are doing is good. My thing is, is like, how do you make that real? Yeah. And thank you for bringing up police oversight. That is one of the, um, one of the results of engagement with the community. Um, that was a long process that led to the standing up of that team. And, and we're still, working out how best to resource that team and how best to have that team be in relationship with the city and with the independent police monitor and and have their voices heard in the best ways it's um it's always a growing process when you start something new um and i'm so glad that you brought that team up and and i am so sorry 
that those incidents have happened to you over the years. And hopefully this team being in place gives a place for complaints to land and complaints to be taken seriously and complaints to be investigated the way they should be. Um, I don't know that it has grown into that quite yet, but I think that is very much the intention of that team. Um, and and you're right. I mean, it's a long, hard journey, and that's not a satisfying answer to your question or your comment. But we've been at it for six years now, and we're just starting to learn some of the things we don't know. Um, and we are champions for being better every day. Um, and and we're not, it's not enough yet. And we know that. And I always appreciate when someone is, is willing to say that out loud, because it's true. Oh, um, and particularly with our African American community, I think it's true. I think we've we've done a lot in our Latino population, and I think Carlos can speak to a lot of that. Um, but we have done less for our African American population, and and so we're we know that, and we're working, but we're not there. Well, I do agree, but like, uh, let me put one thing out. Like, like I said in that article, one line that I really like. It's uh, a guy that went to city council. His name is Leonard. He said, I do not believe that grabbing power away from the community is a viable or ethical answer to the challenges. You just talked about something that was super amazing. For yeah. interpreters. And stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. You said something that's super amazing, which I feel uh, you said uh, in the beginning, I took a picture of it. You said it was uh, dialogue and transparency. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing I've seen in this community is is uh, the word uh, dialogue means we have to be on the same team. If we are not, we are two uh, parallel lines that will never meet. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like you said, well, if we come and we want transparency, if we are building something real, like the EOP, Okay, we can kick somebody out for being bad and we get the war sent. So I think that's one. Mm. And I don't see any transparency there. And uh, to finish my comment is that, um, again, your work is good. I feel blessed to be here. Mm. I feel blessed that I can speak. I feel blessed that I'm in Boulder. I'm raising two kids here, but one of my biggest worry is, is that I can tell you 99% of Immigrant don't have the uh, not encouragement. How do you call it? Right to speak. Right to speak like I do, or understand the community like I do. Mm. They don't because they they're afraid. They're abused. Abuse, yeah. Mm -hmm. Abuse. And the other part of it is is the lack of having someone they can talk to. Like yeah. they group themselves in a small community where they don't make friends with a lawyer, they don't make friends with an engineer, they don't make friends with a pastor or with a staff that understand the law or understand what's going on around them. I think mm -hmm. it's it's uh it's uh it's hard to 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 do that. But my hope is your work can land to the community. But so far, I don't know. I've been here for sixteen years, like I said, uh, I don't see it. It's not there. It's just a virtual thing to me. And uh, if it's, I'm happy to do anything to make it real if I can as well, so. Thank you. That, yeah, I mean, that's that's real. I'm gonna jump into the connector piece to show you some of the things that we are doing. And I'm hearing that you are not seeing them in the community. So that that's real, uh, we're just not, it's not enough yet. And so um, I'm going to share this with you, but I don't want you to think I'm negating what you just said by sharing this next piece. I I hear it and I get it. And we know that we have come, that we are on a long journey and we've come this far of that long journey um, and want you to know what that work is so that you're aware of it um, and can keep telling us what you're seeing and what you're not seeing, because that's important. That's part of how we know. Yeah. Um, 
So thank you for watching me change screens so I could get to this presentation. You might recognize the gentleman in the bottom right corner of this picture. Um, these are our community connectors. This is a picture from two years ago now. Um, this is a program that started in 2018 as a pilot, as does everything in the city of Boulder, the pilot, um, with a project where we really were trying intentionally to reach out to people who were lower income, people who had less access to um, various city resources, people who had not been invited into processes in the past. And so we said, how do we know what people need or the best way to engage with them? And um, we realized we should probably ask them because that's how you find out things you don't know, you ask. So we had some relationships we'd worked on um, with some folks in manufactured housing communities. And we turned to some of those folks and said, will you help us? with this project. Um, and in that way, we tried our community connector program, which we feel has been really effective in the communities where they're centered um, and they're not in every or enough communities. Um, but that work um, looks several different ways. At its heart, that work is hiring people who are of a community to help us be in relationship with that community to help advise us for what that community needs, help design processes with us that will work well in that community for, ha for having dialogue um, and lending us some of the trust that they have, you know, paving that pathway um, so that we as the governments who are not trusted by many communities in our, in our city um, for lots of really good reasons, can walk into spaces where we might normally be viewed with distrust and suspicion, but our connectors help walk us into those spaces and say, no, listen, listen to what they have to say. You don't have to trust yet, but let's listen, right? Um, and so we do that with different programs. Um, we have some commitments that we believe are important to that program. Um, they help us center equity. These programs are about meeting people where they are, not trying to pull them toward us. Um, they're about building trust and power. They're about ongoing two-way dialogue. They're about a commitment to adapting based on what we're hearing. So we're not just walking in and listening. We're walking in, listening, and then walking away and doing something about it. Um, it's about investing in people. And it's about co-designing with community members. Um, we have different programs of the Connector program. One is long-term. Um, we've only done this a few times, but people are part of a working group where they are in dialogue on a project all the way along for two years of a project. Um, we've, you see the beautiful women in this picture have been part of the East Boulder working group. Um, the sub-community plan that was created in East Boulder. And then we have a long-term, uh, that's that's the, more than information than you need today. Uh, we have our short-term um, connector program that is on a project that maybe lasts six months, maybe four months. We're going to council with this decision we want to be sure that we have heard the voices of the community members who will be impacted. Right now, they're planning a park adjacent to Boulder Meadows mobile home community, and they have um, hired two people that live in that community, as well as someone who lives in Ponderosa. Oh, she, they're not, Ponderosa isn't, sorry, Angel is not doing that work anymore. Um, and they're talking with folks who live in Ponderosa, though we don't have a connector on that project at Ponderosa. But those are our closest um, manufactured home communities to that proposed new site for that park. And so they wanted to make sure those people's wishes and dreams and hopes for a park are really heard as part of that process. Um, so that is our project connectors. Um, and then Carlos is part of a team that we call our emergency response connectors. These folks were stood up specifically during COVID 
um, at first with department money and then subsequently with American Rescue Plan Act funding. Um, and they met with us every week for about two and a half years. And now we meet twice a month um, starting April 3rd, 2020. Um, they said, yes, we will be part of this team. We have one or two connectors in every manufactured housing community. We had um, one for a long time who was in a BHP community, one woman who has um, lived at San Juan del Centro and is still part of the team and helps us connect with that community. Um, and then we had volunteers from all over the city who were in whatever neighborhood they were in, um, but were not paid a stipend. So our connectors are paid a stipend for their work. They're paid a monthly stipend based on a number of hours. Um, and so the folks in manufactured housing and subsidized rental communities are paid that stipend. They, meet, they met with us every week. They told us what people were scared about, what people were confused about, what people needed. And then I turned around to Elizabeth Crow, as a matter of fact, and the team that she led of staff members and said, here's what people need. What do we do about it? And she said, I am brilliant and I can help solve all of these problems because she's Elizabeth Crow. And, uh, and we got a lot done. We put thousands of masks out into the community for free. We, once we started getting home tests, we've put hundreds of home tests in the community. And Carlos and his team told us where to host vaccination clinics, what time to host them, what day to host them, and how to get people there. And we vaccinated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people as a result of that work. Um, that team still meets because we are all still figuring out the impacts of COVID, right? And so they're still talking to us. We've focused on resource navigation and resilience building over the last year. We just had a retreat a couple of weeks ago to think about 2024. We're funded through 2025. So we're figuring out what the team evolves into and how to fund it after that. But I have seen the value of being in weekly dialogue with this group. Um, and so we're working hard to make sure that can still happen in some way. It might be twice a month instead of weekly, but um, we'll see. So that's our connector, our emergency response connectors. And then we have our community connectors in residence. Um, I don't get to work directly with this team so much anymore, but they also are a product of COVID. We had another team during COVID called our recovery equity connectors who really focused on policy decision-making. So emergency response connectors are out in neighborhoods, um, navigating resources, giving us direct front lines information. The other team was looking at policy decisions that were being made by the city and projects that were being stood up and other things like that and helping to um, look at whether it was a good or bad idea at the time, essentially. One example is they wanted to close 19th Street to make a outdoor place for people to um, be and socialize and have fun during COVID. And the community Boulder Meadows right next door said, that's, we all use that road a million times a day. And if the bus isn't there, how am I going to get my kids to where my kids need to be, right? And so they didn't close 19. They came up with other strategies instead. Um, so things like that. That team evolved into a permanent team that was just funded forever with, um, well, hopefully will be funded forever if this next budget passes. Um, to look at policy decision-making, staff go to that team and say, we've been working on our racial equity instrument and we have these questions for you. And can you give us feedback on these parts of our project? Um, and so they are really helping voices be heard. There are immigrants on this team. Um, they are a, a, an intentionally demographic team so emergency response connectors are geographic. It depends on where they live is where they represent. This group is intentionally um, demographically diverse. 
Um, so we'll see Selassie, who is from Africa. He's an immigrant from Africa. Um, Jamal, who's African-American, small business owner. Um, we have Adriana, who is a small business owner um, and activist and the, one of the wisest women I've ever met in my life. Um, Ava is a Native American, brings that perspective to the team. Lenora represents older adults with disabilities. So they're really a mix of demographic voices in that room that we engage with regularly. Um, so that that's the connector program. Um, there's a lot there. So I'm happy to answer questions. Hopefully you're seeing how we are starting to try and do some of that work and make those things real. Um, I think COVID had a big silver lining of letting us invest in and try some of these deeper um, relationships with members of the community who then turn around and engage with us on and for us on our behalf um, and really bring in more voices of their community members. I'm gonna stop talking because I talk a lot. Thank you, Brenda. Any questions, clarifications, comments, speaker? I'll take the down so I can see a little better. Uh, Brenda, I feel like in the beginning of your talk, um, it was about engagement and uh, uh, a few of the things that I think in the end, like while you're talking now, it switches to a specific, like what I mean by it is, is that uh, it's an exception to me. COVID was an exception to me. Mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of the whole like, you know, package. I feel like you switched there. Yes, I do understand that's a beginning. I, I'm really, mm -hmm. like that's COVID, you know, it has its bad parts and has its good parts too, to show people, you know. But in the end, um, I don't think we should leave by the exception. We should leave by what the rule should be. Mm -hmm. um, I will give you, uh, well, I, I can take many examples, but I will give you uh, a quick one to understand. Um, for example, for me in the city, um, as an African-American, and I'm not talking only just African-American because I have friends that are from uh, the Middle East mm. that experience the same kind of thing. And the problem with it is it's because they can't, um, they don't know how to, like you said, engage with the system to make it work. So I think what I'm trying to explain to you is, is that me, okay? I own a business. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna give you a quick example so you understand. When somebody walk in, I don't do it anymore because I build that 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 strength to understand, you know, I, I don't have to prove to anyone who we're gonna, I don't. If you look at me, you can see it on my face. I don't care who you are, get out, that's it. But my thing is, it's like, I think a lot of people see the city of Boulder government that way. And in a way where um, the city protects the wealthies. And, and I'm gonna give you a clear example. When I was married mm -hmm. nine years ago, uh, pretty much my ex-wife, I remember the, the meetings. We started an organization in Boulder called Boho, Boulder Homeless Overflow. Okay. And uh, today, Boulder, from there, it went to many different steps because the city keeps pushing more and more to keep these people away. And the end, shelter, we have only one shelter now. There is no... Uh, support for these people. Yes, I understand that we are not a city to give, but at the same time, if the community, we have a huge amount of people that we're pushing away, we're doing a lot of things bad too, I don't think it's good because I do remember I participated mm -hmm. in meetings with CD, a few city members, I think. They would rather give tickets to the homeless that were here 
to go to Denver on a bus, which was three times the amount of money they would have spent if they 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 support, I think, the last shelter they closed on 30th Street. So I don't see the engagement. That's the first thing. Second part of it is, is that uh, like there are a lot of people here that would love to to participate more. I understand you have Celsi, you have uh, Jamal. Yeah, yeah. There's a thing I want you to understand there. Celsi married a white woman. And I'm not saying that in a way that's bad, but one of the things here is she understands the community. She connects Celsi. Mm. When you have someone like my neighbor who is from Iran, not Iran, uh, yeah, Iran, yeah, Iran, I don't know how you say it in English, who him and his wife and two kids came here, he would not have the privilege Celsi has. Celsi is an exception mm. to the rule. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Yeah. Jamal is the same thing. You know, he's from the Bronx, and I've met him. We talked many times. Yeah, yeah. So my thing is, is like I understand these people are in there, but I my engagement for me, it will be to meet the real community. Yeah. Like if you if you go, I'll give you a clear example. There are a lot of programs we have here, so let's see what we know about because his wife will probably read more. It's an example. Sure. And understand the CD and know where to look. But if you look at a community like, um, let's say the one in the, um, what do you call that street there? Let's say, okay, I'm going to take a quick one for you. Like on 30 F, okay, uh, across from the World Power uh, Administration building, I have a lot of friends that live there. And some of them are, you know, American. They're not only, but if you look at them, they don't know. Mm. If somebody doesn't come in during the time of campaign, like it's going on right now, to talk to them about resources and stuff, nobody else. Yeah. So I think, yes, your work is fabulous. It's amazing. It's a beginning. But at the same time, I don't want us to think, yeah, we meet the exception and make it. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. And, and know that... Uh... When I talk about COVID and, and the gift that COVID gave to us, it's because we see how that's a beginning, how um, how what we were in the position to be able to stand up and learn how to do during COVID and the ways that we learned how to ask and how to listen that were new to us, um, give us a place to start building. And that's that's why I attribute um, the silver lining of COVID to that. It doesn't mean that that we're stopping. It means that we are taking what we learned from from having a different focus and a different priority, um, and saying, "But but how do we take what's best of that and keep doing it in ways that help us hear people?" Um, one of the teams things that that community connectors and residents team does is they created a training. Um, that is for community members that they deliver that is about how county government works and how city government works and the different resources that are available, but also the different ways that people can engage and get involved in the system. And they facilitate that training and they facilitate it in their own communities and in the languages of their communities. Um, which is a really amazing thing. You know, we sort of had a few bones of that that we gave them and they created what they felt like people need to know in order to get through some of those barriers of not being invited into a process, being in a new country, um, having dealt with governments that were out to actually harm them in the past or sometimes in the present, right? Um, and, and give them those resources so that they know and can start to make some of those choices about where to get involved. Um, it's called Building Power, Raising Voices, and it's pretty cool training. So if one wanted to host it at one's place of business, we would be happy to come there and do it um, so that your neighbors and your community members could have that information too. 
I want to make a little space for Carlos just because he is in this program to make sure I haven't missed anything. He wants to make sure you all know about the program. You said the name is Building Power and Raises Voices? Bil building Power Raising Voices. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Carlos, anything? No, I think uh, last time uh, and last meeting we talked about that too. Oh, good. And that part. If they want to know more about the program, and that's why you are here today. Usually I let Carlos talk more, sorry. <laughs> he I has told this. Questions or speaker? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just uh -huh. going to say that I think the community connectors is such a good idea. Um, smaller groups, I feel like, allow people to be more open and get to honestly connect with people. I, I'm sorry if you've already covered this, but um, how do how does someone find a community connector if they were new to the community? That's a great question, and and something that we are working on. You know, we started particularly with the emergency response connectors. We asked them to bring their own networks into the conversation, right? So they still receive a weekly email that's full of information and community events and resources, um, and they each have a network of houses, households that they reach with that email. Sometimes it's not email, sometimes it's text, sometimes it's WhatsApp, sometimes it's phone calls many of them have made in the past to people they know need it. Um, and we estimated at one point we reach about a thousand households with that. But again, those are neighborhood focused. So if you're in those neighborhoods where they live, you are likely to know about your connector and be able to find them. Um, otherwise, the community connector and residence team, I don't know that we, because they're private community members, I don't know that we post like contact information for them anywhere. Um, so that's a really good question. How could a community member reach out to someone on that team if they wanted to? I don't think I have a great answer. So right now I'm going to say me, reach out to me and I can connect you with connectors and and I will trust them to sort of know who's the right voice to connect you with. Is that not a great answer for the community, but I offer that answer to you and recognize it would be great to have an answer for that for the community. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brent. Right, I've taken all the time. <laughs> so you tell me what happens next. Oh, sure. Please. Um, right, it's Elizabeth. Just one thing I, I think um, from one of the things that you mentioned, JH, um, my understanding of connectors is that, um, it, I'm not sure if you said it um, or not, so tell me if this, is ac if this is accurate and Carlos. People who are connectors are, they are, there to serve as liaisons, provide that guidance, provide that input, and not necessarily they're thinking that they're representing an entire population, which I think um, isn't it can be an important distinction, right? Like if somebody's mm -hmm. they are representing a, a particular organization or group or community, um, but people are. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because I think it's yeah. an important yeah. distinction and I realize I should really no, no, be no. on kind of how they see themselves. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and Carlos, jump in as you wish. Um, so starting with community connectors and residents, they're consulted by staff on a weekly basis on any number of projects. Um, and yes, they bring their own perspective to those conversations. They're also asked to engage with their community members and come back and bring that feedback, um, depending on the project. So most recently, it was on the, the budget, the proposed 2024 budget. Um, each of the members of that community connectors and residence team went and did engagement conversations with members of their community. Um, some of them held meetings where people were invited. Some of them had one-on-one -on -one conversations with a number of people, but they really tried to gather input on 
some of those budget choices and bring that back to um, the, te the team as a whole and then the budget finance team. Um, and they also went to city council and shared that information in a very um, part as part of the agenda presentation to city council on the budget. Um, so that is, so it's sort of both of those things that you said, Elizabeth. So they both bring their own perspective to conversations and they go and gather up voices in their communities and then represent those voices in those conversations. Emergency response connectors, I would say, are similar. They bring their own knowledge and lived experience and perspective to our conversations. And I mentioned the weekly email that they send out every week. Um, so they're sharing information that way. And then sometimes we say, hey, go ask your community members if they need tests or they need this specific to COVID, right? That has changed and evolved over the three years we've been together. And we've started to ask them to go ask their community members about other things too. So they also um, work in that way on a less formal basis. Thank Does that you. feel right, Carlos? Yeah. Yeah. If I may, Brenda, um, mm -hmm. this is Ingrid. Um, I also would like to recognize and acknowledge that ever since, and I'm, I'm using the same example of COVID because I think the overall community started organizing differently than prior to COVID. I have seen through social media and different groups that there is a more reiteration of what the work that the community is doing and repetition. So it's not uncommon to see a flyer here and then see the same flyer here, um, including events that are hosted by the city, like um, the Foothills, um, fair that we had um, in summer where community members were invited to come and connect with different departments of the city. And this is an annual event that hasn't happened um, because of COVID and this year it happened. Um, and, and there's other opportunities that I think community members have in addition to um, community connectors and all of the connectors programs to bring their perspectives and speak up, including open comment here at the HRC and many of the other boards and commissions um, and other task force too, that we lean on community members to learn from them and being able to bring um, their input and their experiences into the work that we do. So I, I know this is kind of the tip of at least the specific work that the commun communications and engagement team does, but I want you to also be aware that there's so many other channels and opportunities to engage, including being part of task force and um, boards and commissions. Do you know um, how many community connectors you have at all? Um, I think active right now, we have about 22 in those different program levels that we talked about. Um, and then we have a list of about 10 or 12 who have been in those roles in the past who are no longer in those roles. Um, and we're starting to build a list of people who are interested to learn about when we have opportunities. So I would say there's probably about 35 people in the overall conversation, rough estimate. I know we're five minutes to eight. I and know. You Sorry. also were going to present on a different topic. I was. I was. Um, Do we have any time? Doing? Me? I'm okay. It's How not all doing. Well, we need to decide. It's on the commission. Um, we have other items to cover. Yeah. But it's it. How are you doing? Good. Are you doing good? Me? I'm okay. <laughs> Vicar? Do you want to do a quick like estimate of time? So yeah, when are you gonna stop? <laughs> when are we gonna? That's stop? real. I love to know from the. I have some 
Oh, I was screen sharing. Also, the um, do you am I screen sharing still? No, I um, I stopped for Brenda, but I can. I, yeah, I started. Sorry. Okay. Um, we have um chronic news um conversation that Brenda was gonna share it with us and oh thank you Elizabeth um I also we also have updates on the human relations fund racial equity work immigrant mm -hmm. legal fund but we can we can yeah we can That's kind of go ahead and um these are smaller items I have to say yeah. so I have to leave about um, 835. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can be um, quick. Okay. If you still want me. If not, I understand. It's okay. Because that's fine. And figure gave the thumbs up. I'm going to feel the sugar. It's so for it, Brenda. Okay. Uh, I won't even use the slideshow because that'll just slow me down. Um, we and I will try to talk at a reasonable pace. Thank you. Um, so we are, one of the things I do in my role is I help guide these community conversations with folks we want to hear from on various decisions, right? One of the decisions that we are working on right now that we will bring to city council is an update of what is called the chronic nuisance ordinance. Um, it's part of a larger strategy to sort of help people live well with each other. Um, it's, we recently passed a refreshed noise ordinance that addressed daytime noise um, from amplified music around people's homes. Um, we also passed a refresh of weeds and trash, which change the process that that was enforced um, for homes that are neglecting their weeds and trash in ways that cause public safety issues. Um, and then this piece is chronic nuisance, which enforces patterns of violations um, at a property. Property is an interesting word because um, a condo complex is one property. A manufactured home community is one property. Um, an apartment building is one property. And a single family home is one property, right? So a property is many things. <laughs> and this ordinance addresses things that are happening at a property. Um, it really is designed to help the city be in better conversation about compliance with property owners and managers. Um, it's not focused on tenants if people are renting those properties. It's really focused on what is happening at a property that is making it unsafe or having an impact on the neighborhood. Um, so right now what that looks like is if you have two violations in a period of time that I don't remember, um, you can be cited for chronic nuisance. Um, as you can imagine, everybody gets some violations on their property sometimes, and two is not very many. And so it's not a usable law because we would be using it all the time. And that's not really what it's intended for. It's intended for people who are not taking care of business at their property. And so things are repeatedly putting people who live there in danger or putting the neighborhood in danger or causing life um, livability issues in the neighborhood, right? Um, it can be noise, it can be trash and weeds, but it can also be um, electricity issues, not up to code. It can be fire doors that are blocked all the time so people can't get out. Um, it can also be levels of crime that are happening on a community's prop on a property. Um, so all of those different things, when done repeatedly, can activate this law. So we're working on reform for it. We're working right now on what the number of violations is and what the time period are. Um, and we're working on sort of 
what an investigation process looks like so that once it's been described, it's been identified that this property has a pattern of violations, how do we understand what that pattern is, why it's happening, what the true needs are on that property before we can go into a chronic nuisance enforcement level. It might be that there are steps along the way that a landlord or a property owner can take before it escalates to a violation. So I said a lot of things, but we are really trying to talk with people who we think will be impacted in one way or another by this new version of this law. So I have been to visit students who live potentially on the Hill or in other places in the city. Um, we have talked with Boulder Area Rental Housing Association, the people who own buildings that many people across the city live in um, or, or manage those buildings. We're in conversation with Boulder Housing Partners. We've been to see the Tenant Advisory Committee. Um, I've done some interviews with folks I know who are tenants of buildings, and we're also planning on going to do some interviews with some folks who live in subsidized rental that's not Boulder Housing Partners, um, where we know there's a pattern of issues on their property. Um, and we have been I'm trying to think where else we've been. We've talked with administration at CU that works with off-campus housing as well, including their team of lawyers. Um, so we're really trying to understand the perspective of anyone this might impact. And it really is a small percentage of properties across the city. Um, it's folks who definitely see either building code violations or um, police violations happen at their properties. We have gathered a bunch of data to figure out who's the sort of top end of that list and that's who we've reached out to. So I wanted to say all that to you all because I know that you are our person-centered, most focused on impact team at the city. And, and so I just wanted to see, hear what red flags you see, um, hear what we need to be taking into account, and also hear what you think might be helpful about this law. And please ask all the questions, because I don't know if anything I've said makes sense. I'm way too inside it <laughs> to know if I've communicated it well. Uh, I do have a slideshow that has questions. Let me ask those questions. Let me put those up. Maybe that helps. Brenda, could you hear? No. Was someone speaking? And I've lost picture in the room. Me too, Brenda. Let me also message oh, them. Oh, there we go. Now we can hear, I think. Or maybe we heard through Elizabeth. Yeah, it's computers, computers frozen. frozen. We have echo. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Nope. nope. Oh. <laughs> Let's see, I'm co host. I'm going to mute and unmute Ingrid's computer and see if that does anything. It did nothing. Yeah, it's frozen. Um, check, check, check. Uh, I see a question in the chat that I'll answer if you all can hear me. Um, and maybe Elizabeth can just do that that way quickly. Um, noise violations are enfo enforced by the police, um, by the sort of regular police as opposed to weeds and trash, which is the police code enforcement team. Um, 
So there's three enforcement folks involved here. Um, the first, oh, Elena's audio also has a lot of echo. Um, so interpretation might be tricky at the moment. Um, Elena, thank you. Just do your best. And Mayra, we appreciate it. Um, so there's three enforcement agencies in this conversation. The first is just regular police officers who enforce the law in many ways. The second is the police code enforcement team who enforce things like weeds and trash and um, bear trash and many other things that Jen, I, I should have a list of what Jen's team does, but I don't. Um, and then there's our planning and development code enforcement team, and they enforce building safety. So they're the people that do an inspection before you can get a rental license. They also enforce construction violations and other things related to the building itself. Speaker, any questions? I am not hearing anything. No question. Yeah. Oh, do you have a question, Fakir? Oh, no other questions. Okay. All right. So maybe I will send. Oh, I changed this thing. I'm showing you off the questions to see if I could message Elizabeth. Um, so here is some questions that if you have answers to now, great, um, except that we can't hear you, but you could ask someone to put them in the chat or I can send these questions out to you. And if you have any feedback, um, you can provide it to me that way, or you, you and I can have coffee, um, anyone who might wanna talk further about this and we can have more discussions. So I think we'll leave that there while you all figure out your technical needs. Thank you, Brenda. Brenda thank you, I'm... Thank you, I'm... Thank you, I'm... Oh. I might need a shutdown and restart by someone's computer on that end. Yeah. I see Tiffany's came online. It does Perfect. not. We just, we just have, have half, half a full tech, tech, tech failure, failure over here. Over here. Ingrid's, Ingrid's trying. But... Uh, why is that? I wonder if the meeting, I wonder if the hybrid meeting on the machine in the room ended at eight. I set it up on something. Oh. Darn, I was hoping I had a magic answer. It was a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no other questions here right now. Okay, so I will plan to send you this information um, and we can, um, you can provide me with feedback, um, through the email, or if you want to sit down and have a conversation, I will include my contact information, um, and you can reach out to me and we can set up a conversation together. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry that we can't have more dialogue around this at this time. Thank I you. will exit and let you all. Yeah, get through what you can get through for the rest of your meeting. Brenda, it looks like we're actually still viewing your screen. Are you still sharing? Your... That's better. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Speaker, bear with us. Okay.
Speaker, can you see the chat? Yes. So we're proposing adjourning here and finishing the updates on email instead. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Apologies to anybody who's watching. We just have had quite a tech failure this evening. Thank you, Elizabeth. Have a good night, everyone. I motion to adjourn the meeting, um, the HRC meeting held October 17, 2023.